Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Levesque. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics here at St. Anselm College. Um, I want to welcome you all to another uh, event here before the 2020 election, and of course, 100 years after uh, uh, the women's suffrage movement uh, really changed the landscape of our nation. Um, we have a, a wonderful um, author tonight, um, and a wonderful um, set of students doing some great uh, interviewing. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Um, tonight's presentation, of course, is going to be recorded. Uh, so all of you need to be aware of that. Uh, we'll be posting this on many different channels, including YouTube. Um, we also um, put on these programs and many of the programs as we go through uh, 2020. Um, uh, with the great help of AARP New Hampshire. Um, they have been a wonderful partners and have really been um, right by our side as we really try to present as many civic education events as possible. Uh, so for tonight, uh, we've got two great students, Courtney Hull and Joe Cavanaugh, who are really gonna take the reins here. And so I wanna turn it over to Joe uh, for the purposes of introduction. Joe? All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Allison Lang is our author of Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement, which is a book focusing on women's rights and gender influences in politics, uh, particularly the women's suffrage movement. Uh, she's currently a history professor at Wentworth Institute of, Pol of uh, Technology in Boston. Uh, her work is supported by numerous nationally recognized institutions, including the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Humanities, just to name a couple. Um, other than that, Dr. Lang, thank you so much for talking with us. And is there anything that you would like to add? Thank you so much for uh, hosting me tonight. I'm very excited to um, to be a part of this uh, conversation. And I'm excited to uh, talk to both you and Courtney um, at the end of the presentation of, uh, with you know, questions and see what you guys think. Um, as you guys already mentioned, this is uh, in 2020, this is the year of the centennial of the 19th Amendment's ratification. Uh, and so there's a lot of you know, exciting suffrage related um, programs and exhibitions and documentaries and things coming out. And so I'm excited to, you know, connect to that, um, all of that um, in our talk today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share this, my screen, because uh, you might be able to guess that I have, uh, you know, I, I focus on images. Uh, my book actually has 105 images. Um, and my emphasis is really thinking about the ways that these images are part of politics uh, and really shape the ways we think about gender in the United States and throughout the United States history. But I wanted to start actually with just one terminology, you know, um, suffrage is not a term we use very regularly in the 21st century, but it actually was incredibly common in the 19th century. It means the right to vote. And so people talked in the 19th century about white male suffrage, about black male suffrage, but for some reason, women's suffrage has stuck with us. You know, that terminology has stuck with us far longer um, than it has for um, other types of voting rights movements. So just to give you a sense of where we're starting today. And I wanted to start by thinking about the ways that uh, the images of women's voting rights are still part of the imagery of the 21st century, particularly with regard to politics and social movements. And, you know, this summer we've been able to see, or, you know, recently we've been able to see a lot of social movements in progress. This particular photograph is of the Women's March in Washington, D.C. in January 2017. And you might be able to recognize uh, Susan B. Anthony, who's the one wearing glasses, uh, being held um, as a poster in this particular protest. Um, and she's with Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, as well as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And this is, you know, uh, you know, fascinating because this is a group of people um, who in this particular instance, and we can point to many others, where they are calling upon, you know, referring to um, women in the past who kind of paved the way uh, for political protests um, of recent years. 
Another image that I wanted to point out uh, that some of you might have seen before, this is from uh, 1913. This is of Inez Milholland riding a horse in the first national suffrage parade in Washington, DC, in which over 5,000 suffragists marched. And she is uh, particularly famous in 1913. She is known as the most beautiful suffragist, but I do want to add that she also was one of the first women to earn a law degree um, from NYU, which was one of the very few universities allowing women to uh, earn a law degree. Um, and she uh, was, this particular photograph of her was very famous. Uh, and it was, you know, recalled this past summer when this photograph of Brianna Noble during the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you know, the protests in, in June, uh, became a, a viral image of that particular movement. She's riding this horse um, into downtown Oakland, California, which, you know, seems a little bit uh, you know, maybe even less expected in 2020 than it would have been in 1913. And so this became a really powerful um, image of, of, of a movement. And it's so powerful that in fact that I just recently noticed um, this commercial that came out recently um, that features Brianna Noble on her horse uh, riding through a city to, to sell a service. Um, and so it's really interesting to see the ways that, you know, this image of women on horses is, is kind of have, has been part of social movements and, and really powerful imagery of social movements, you know, for over a century. The other thing I wanted to kind of think about is the fact that the suffragists were the first ever group to picket the White House. They did that in January of 1917, and you can see the photograph of that below. Um, and so they were really the ones that made protesting the White House, you know, uh, made the White House a place of political protest. And I thought it was really interesting that earlier this summer, of course, we see that co continuing. Um, we see, we saw, for example, this Black Lives Matter um, being uh, painted on the street right outside the White House. And I think it's fair to say that when we're thinking about, you know, important places for protest, of course, the Women's March is another example and plenty of other examples beyond that. Um, the, the, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House is still, you know, central to that, uh, to political protest history. And then, of course, we have a lot of women in politics wearing white recently. Um, this particular photograph is from the January 2020 uh, State of the Union address. Um, and so this is, you know, an image of, of women, female political figures wearing white to, to recall the suffragists. Um, and you might not know that the suffragists actually decided to wear white because then they would show up in photographs of their marches better. So one of the things they did was hire publicity professionals. Um, and if you've seen any historical photographs, you know that they are black and white. You know that they're not quite the same quality that they are in the 21st century. And if you've ever seen, you know, original newspapers from the early 20th century, you know that those photographs are not, you know, beautifully reproduced um, in the way that we see in modern publications. And so wearing white in these marches made them stand out better. And so even this kind of visual legacy that the suffragists established in the early 20th, 20th century is something that 100 years later is still very much part of our political culture. And I'm sure you guys may have your own examples that have stood out to you um, over the past few years. But I'm actually going to start thinking about the history of women's voting rights activism and the imagery of that activism by looking at the people who opposed it. We're going to start far earlier than the women's suffrage movement, you know, began. This is 1775 print. As you all know, this is a year before the Declaration of Independence. You know, the colonial rebellion is on the rise. Um, people are boycotting tea. In this particular case, it's a group of women in Edenton, North Carolina. Um, and the artist is a London artist, Philip Daw, who probably never went to the colonies, but he probably did read a newspaper article about these women in North Carolina who decided to sign a petition to boycott tea. So this is a print imagining what that scene is like. And it is, you know, to 18th century eyes, this would have been a scene of chaos. So we have these people gathered around this table. A woman is signing the document, you know, being, you know, ca uh, cajoled into it by her perhaps lover. Another woman is uh, appearing very masculine, uh, not idealized, you know, uh, a femininity for the 18th century. She has a gavel in her hand. 
a woman in the back is holding a big punch bowl. Um, and if you know anything about 18th century material culture, you know that that, uh, that punch bowl is intended for alcohol. So this is a, a drunken scene. Um, and they're all ignoring the child under the table. The only thing paying attention to the child under the table is this dog who is also urinating on a tea canister. So these you know, unattractive women are paying attention to politics, ignoring their families, ignoring their family responsibilities. The other detail that I really wanna make sure we, we take a moment to look at is the black woman who is holding out a quill, um, an inkwell, and she looks interested in signing this petition as well. She looks interested in joining this boycott and becoming a political figure too. And just to remind you, this is Edenton, North Carolina, 1775. She's probably intended to represent an enslaved woman. So Philip Daw is imagining a scene where women are not only threatening the patriarchy, um, that if Black women are interested in too, they're also threatening this racial hierarchy that's in place, as well as the economic institution of slavery. Um, and of course, you all know that the British Empire and the colonies were certainly dependent on that economic institution. And the fascinating thing about anti-women's rights you know, imagery over the years is that it remains remarkably similar. So this is a print from 1851. Um, this is 75 years later, right about. Um, there has been a lot of shifts. Um, the women's rights movement has on, been on the rise and it really grew out of the anti-slavery movement by the 1840s. There are petitions to local um, and state governments to uh, secure more women's rights by 1848. There's the Seneca Falls Convention. By 1850, we have the first National Women's Rights Convention happening in Worcester, Massachusetts. And there's also right about this time, dramatic improvements in image technology that make distributing images like this even easier, even cheaper. The masses uh, can have access to a picture like this one. So this is a picture that is representative of many, many more. We have a woman in the center. She is smoking. She is wearing bloomers. She is exposing her ankle, which is quite scandalous uh, in the 19th century. Uh, she has her hand, you know, put condescendingly, I think, you know, on who a man who I believe is her husband. Um, and he is hunched over, mending clothes, doing this very menial domestic work. Um, as this child in the front cries and, you know, holds a banner saying no more Papa and Mama. So he's being abandoned by, you know, this, this mother who is, who is more interested in women's rights and smoking uh, than caring for her family. In the background, we have two women also, you know, part of this protest. One woman I think is intended to be a domestic servant. Um, she is uh, holding a sign that says no more basement and kitchen. The other one is a black woman who is smoking a pipe uh, and she's protesting against slavery. So this is you know, very much similar to the previous print. You know, if women win rights, it threatens you know, class hierarchy, it, cla it threatens the racial hierarchy. Um, and you know, when people, uh, uh, you know, when artists created these, uh, these images and when printers published them, they were hoping to make money. And because most Americans in the 19th century opposed women's rights, um, they had a large audience for this. And they expected Americans to laugh at these images because they would have thought, or many of them would have thought that these were just simply absurd. Um, and yet they also illustrate um, how the anxieties that Americans had about women's rights at this time. You know, people were deeply afraid um, of this possibly coming true. And just to give you a sense of just how common this kind of imagery is, this is from Harper's New Monthly Magazine the same year in 1851. We have another image of women wearing bloomers. Again, the skirts are far shorter than women's rights activists actually wore. Uh, the skirts often went down to past your ankles. They're smoking, they've got writing crops in their hand. But just to emphasize that they are, uh, these are aggressive women, there's a bulldog in the front. We even have two women locking arms. 
suggesting that women are not only, you know, relegating men to the domestic sphere um, that was once previously theirs, but that they no longer need men and that they can have these more intimate relationships with other women instead. The only man in this scene um, is the man who is fleeing the scene, has their back towards, has his back towards them. So this is from 1869, nearly 100 years after that first image. And we see, you know, a slightly different scene. We see, but we still see a woman smoking. We still see um, the kind of rhetoric on the billboard saying, vote for the celebrated man tamer, Susan Sharptongue. I um, mean, we see one additional theme, one additional trope that um, is incredibly popular in 19th century anti-women's rights imagery, which is of this woman who is, you know, holding her fist at a man who I think is her husband, um, being told that he must care for the child and he looks, incredibly appalled um, by this possibility. So these kinds of images are just part of American society. You know, people have uh, these stereotypes about women in politics, what might happen if women win, uh, win the right to vote. Of course, by 1869, that's the year that women in Wyoming, the territory of Wyoming, actually do secure the right to vote. And that's when the 15th Amendment, um, which prohibits voter discrimination based on race, is actually being discussed and debated. So this is, you know, people are wondering, you know, maybe women really will vote uh, across the nation someday by this time. And so you can imagine why suffragists, women's rights activist leaders decide to kind of try and do something about this. Um, and a new type of visual medium actually allows them to take control in a way that they really didn't, couldn't have done before. So they don't have access, you know, they're not the editors of newspapers. They are not, um, you know, uh, publishers of newspapers. So this is one thing that they can control. By 1855, there's a brand new type of photograph technology called the wet plate process. And for the first time, Americans can reproduce photographs over and over again on paper and expose the photographs on glass plates and, and as long as that glass plate remains intact, they can create printed paper pictures. And if you guys remember the days of, you know, dropping off film to be printed, um, that is very much the, the descendant of this earlier wet plate process technology. And so what happens is that these suffragists for the first time can actually make their faces known to a broader audience. You know, if you know anything about early photography, you probably know about daguerreotypes, which are these very tiny, impossible to reproduce pictures, which were, you know, amazing and people loved them, but you can't reproduce them. So in the 1860s, Sojourner Truth, uh, who was born in the late 1790s, um, enslaved for the first, you know, 30 years of her life, um, and became a woman's rights and anti-slavery leader, she decides to start sitting for her photograph. Um, if you, uh, you know, read about Frederick Douglass before, Frederick Douglass, um, another uh, um, formerly enslaved person who became a really important civil rights and women's rights um, activist. Um, he, he believed that photography was incredibly valuable for challenging racist stereotypes. You know, he wrote, he wrote about this, he gave lectures on this. And Sojourner Truth probably, you know, might have read these, might have heard these. Um, so she decides in the 1860s to actually sit for her own photographs. And so this is an example of that. Um, this is a carte de visite. So it's very small. It's about this size. Um, and I always tell my students, they're kind of like baseball cards. They're really cheap. Uh, you wanna collect them all. You want ones of you know, the current president. You want ones of your favorite actors and actresses, authors, you know, whoever um, interests you is who you want a carte de visite of in the 19th century. And so you have Sojourner Truth here imagining how she wants to present herself to us, the public. And so she's seated here. She has, she's next to, you know, a vase of flowers, a book, some knitting um, to kind of emphasize this kind of domestic parlor setting. And she's got very simple clothing on, a really plain shawl, you know, for 19th century standards, I should, I should add, a plain shawl, a head wrap, um, and this is to really emphasize that she is not a frivolous person and she is also a working woman. She is not wealthy here. And see, she says at the bottom, I sell the shadow to support the substance. 
I mentioned that they're exposing these photographs on glass plates and they are doing that by using sunlight at this time. And so it literally is a shadow. So it's a popular term for, for, for a photograph. I sell the shadow to support the substance, meaning that she is supporting herself. She is the substance as well as her substantial reforms that she is uh, putting into place. She actually copyrights this photograph herself. Um, she very much is in control of her, her public image. Uh, she sits for this, you know, she, whenever she sits for a new photograph, they look incredibly similar from sitting to sitting. So she had a very particular idea of how she wanted to uh, be, you know, presented to the public and how she wanted to challenge racist and sexist stereotypes that were so popular at that time. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Susan B. Anthony in particular, saw, you know, that this was a good idea idea that we should we should show the faces of these women's rights leaders and prove these cartoons wrong and so this is of a a session from 1870 taken in new york um, by napoleon Sereny, and this is uh, this becomes a, a very popular photograph so popular that this becomes one that anti-women's rights cartoonists use to make fun of them so as women's rights leaders faces become more familiar the imagery changes to make fun of specific women's rights activists. And this, of course, is Susan B. Anthony. Um, and it's very much the similar kind of imagery from earlier, um, earlier cartoons. We've got Anthony, you know, standing, you know, hand on hip, umbrella in hand, something like a sword. Her skirt is far too short and it's showing her boots that actually have spurs on them. In the background, there's a women, uh, women's political rally, which is not something that activists were doing in the 19th century yet. A female police officer, and then of course, again, you know, the 19th century version of the apocalypse, a man carrying a baby and a man carrying groceries. So these men are having to do these domestic tasks. And you can see that the artist directly copied uh, that 1870 photograph, and it's entitled The Woman Who Dared. So the assumption by 1873 when this was published is that you have a pretty good sense, you could recognize even who Susan B. Anthony is. And the artist takes it one step further to get a little extra dig at Anthony. She had an eye issue in her lifetime and she often was photographed in profile so that she could hide that. She did not want people to see it. Um, but you can see in this up close version of this image that the artist actually replicated it in this cartoon. Um, so we can see closely um, this, this aspect of her body that she was very sensitive to. But suffragists, as you know, didn't want to be seen that way. They wanted to look more like this, you know, in this kind of imagery of you know, elite white men in power, you know, had been part of American political culture, you know, since its founding. I mean, you know, has an even longer history, of course, um, with European roots. This is how they wanted women's rights leaders to be perceived as well. And so in 1881, the first of six volumes of the history of women's suffrage was published. These volumes are a thousand pages each. They are incredibly um, dense, uh, full of primary sources, and, and they tell a particular story. The story that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who edited the, the volumes, they tell the story that they wanted to tell. And these, these books actually still very much influence the story that we tell about the suffrage movement today. They also influence who we remember. Each of the volumes features portraits of the leaders that these women deemed important. Um, even though Susan B. Anthony had a photograph of Sojourner Truth, she did not include Sojourner Truth or any women of color in these volumes. They also didn't include any men. Um, and as you might guess, you know, in the 19th century and well into the, you know, through the passage of the 19th Amendment, men were incredibly important to the suffrage movement. They were the voters, they were the ones in office. Um, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Parker Pillsbury, these were leading men uh, in the suffrage movement. They also, in this volume, did, in these volumes, did not include uh, organizations that were 
um, not their own. So they told the story of, from the point of view of their own organization, excluding the even larger organization that was uh, competing with them. Of course, throughout this time, you know, we continue to have uh, imagery making fun of women's rights. This is a, a woman in bloomers, but this time she's got a bicycle. But she's still leaving her husband to do these domestic chores, uh, watching children, making dinner, doing the laundry. Um, so things in anti-women's rights imagery are changing little. However, the path that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton created with, you know, creating these portraits of women's rights leaders, that gets more organized in the suffrage movement in the late 19th century. The National American Women's Suffrage Association actually creates a national press committee with state press committees. They hire publicity professionals. The, the first kind of big generation of female professional artists is on the rise. They actually found their own publishing company so that they could publish images like this. So women are starting to not just be the consumers of these pictures, but they're starting to create these pictures and tell a very different story. And you can see in this one by Blanche Ames, who's actually a Massachusetts artist, double the power of the home, two good votes are better than one. So it's telling a very different story of suffrage um, than, than had been told 50 years earlier. So this imagines what a good voter, according to these suffragists, is. So it's a woman who is, uh, you know, surrounded by her three children in a very idealized home. She's not required to work. She's probably well off enough to be able to be at home with her children. Has a God bless our home sign uh, on the wall and a steaming kettle in the background. So she's a domestic figure, she is a caregiver, and rather than having, you know, women's voting rights lead to her abandoning her family, in fact, suffragists are arguing that if women win the vote, they will be able to take better care of their family. This is a poster from the National Women's Suffrage Publishing Company by Rose O'Neill, who was um, actually a designer of the Cupid doll, if you've heard of that. And it very much reiterates this point, give mother the vote, we need it. And specifically, they're thinking about white women, they're thinking about well-off, fairly well-educated white women. They're not really thinking, of, 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 uh, NASA is not really thinking of this broader group of women's voting rights activists. And there's a, a, a transition in the type of people who are um, in support of women's voting rights uh, among the mainstream press, particularly in the 1910s. So whereas the previous stereotype of women's rights activists was this kind of frumpy, unfashionable woman, you know, wearing glasses and a, you know, a, a not as elegant hat. You know, on the other hand, we see in this cartoon called The Type Has Changed, we see this incredibly fashionable woman with a towering hat. And you can see that this is far more similar to the idealized versions of femininity that are popular. Um, around the turn of the century. This is, uh, of course, the Gibson girl stereotype um, that you might be familiar with. But these images really don't include, they don't tell the whole story. And so when we're thinking about, you know, who's a suffragist and who isn't, one woman in, in, in representative of many other women who were excluded of the popular imagery of the suffrage movement, um, Mary Church Terrell, who was one of the first black women to earn an undergraduate degree from Oberlin College. Um, and she was the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. So whereas white women led organizations actually really focused specifically on the vote, the National Association of Colored Women recognized that there was violence against black people, they recognized that black men were increasingly losing the right to vote. They saw that um, Plessy versus Ferguson, of course, the Supreme Court case that was uh, passed, that, uh, that was ruled on that year, um, which endorsed um, segregation, separate but equal facilities. Um, they knew that there were broader issues uh, that women of color really needed to focus on. It wasn't just about the vote. But that, of course, doesn't mean that they weren't fighting for the vote. And Terrell really tried to work with the National Association of Colored Women to kind of create a visual campaign, but the NACW just did not have the resources. They did not have the funding, they did not have the staff, 
to create the campaign um, that the, the white suffragists whose you know, imagery and propaganda we're probably much more familiar with, um, they just didn't have the resources for that. But Tara worked on her own to distribute as many images of, that she, as she could. And she's very much trying to convince the public that she is this black woman is just as elegant, just as refined, just as respectable as these white female suffragists. And you can see the interesting similarity between this representation of her, which was from one of her bulletins from a, a lecture that she gave, um, and its similarity to this, you know, idealized um, uh, image of the new Negro woman um, from 1904. And we talked about a little bit about the 1913 parade at the very beginning with this image of Inez Milholland on her horse as the herald of this parade. And I want to come back to it because I want to emphasize the, you know, the tension among suffragists um, at this time, especially around the issue of race. Inez Milholland actually had to work to convince suffragists to allow women of color to march in the parade. And she ultimately was successful of, at that. Mary Church Terrell marched in the parade, as did Ida B. Wells, a contingent of Delta Sigma Theta um, uh, sisters from the Howard University did. And, and there are plenty more examples as well. But I'm going to show you this racist stereotype just to give you a sense of you know, what, what popular conversations are looking like at this time. And this is a critical view of the white suffragists who are um, unwilling to allow black women to march with them, but it's also a racist view of these black suffragists who are being represented with exaggerated features um, and, and in, in an incredibly unflattering manner. So you can get a sense of why for Terrell, for Ida B. Wells, for so many other black women, it was so important to challenge these stereotypes. And so whereas a lot of the images, all the images that I've shown you tonight are very common. This one is unusual. This one is more unique. It's not fully unique. There are other copies of it, but um, it's incredibly far fewer. So I have not found any images from, you know, white-led suffrage organizations, no propaganda, emphasizing that Black women, women of color more generally, need the right to vote. This is really the only piece of propaganda that I've found that emphasizes that Black women need the vote. And it was published by the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It was printed in The Crisis, which was their publication, but it was also printed on its own as a poster, as a broadside. And so it features a Black woman standing up, holding the federal constitution in her hand, and she is beating down segregation, Jim Crow laws, and grandfather clauses. And she is protecting the two children in her skirts. And it's called the South's Battalion of Death. And at the bottom, it says, what votes for women means to the South. And this is because people realize that one of the reasons why there is opposition to the 19th Amendment, the proposed 19th Amendment, is that people are afraid that women of color will gain the right, right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Of course, as we know, uh, the 15th Amendment, which prohibited voter, uh, voter discrimination based on race, was being very much over ignored um, because of the literacy tests and poll taxes that had been passed, particularly in Southern states beginning in 1890. And those uh, discriminatory laws applied to women of color as well. So it was a real challenge uh, to, to vote, um, even after the 19th Amendment, uh, for many Black women in the South, um, but also for um, Native American women uh, who did not um, have full citizen citizenship rights, um, Asian American women, and so forth. So the 19th Amendment is very much an incomplete victory. And it's not, you know, if we're talking about the imagery that really helps secure the vote. It is this imagery that we are looking at um, that emphasized that women were caregivers, right? So this is from 1917 when the United States is in dire need of female nurses for World War I, very much playing off of that earlier caregiving suffrage imagery uh, that I pointed to just a few moments before, emphasizing that this is the greatest mother in the world. That is why we value women um, in American society at that time. And I do want to point out, you know, especially in this current moment, um, one of the things that has always puzzled me was why there's this moment between Woodrow Wilson, 
addressing the Senate September 30th, 1918, and telling them to um, pass the suffrage amendment um, and pass it on to the states. They don't do that. Um, and I think it's really interesting to note that within the following week after his address, Washington DC is hit hard by the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, they actually closed the House of Representative galleries. A lot of political leaders fall ill. Um, and you know, as you, you may know, there are multiple waves of this pandemic and women are called on to be really important nurses and caregivers, both in hospitals, but also in communities during this crisis. And so I think it's really interesting, um, and we can probably understand a little bit better why it does take until June of 1919 for the uh, for Congress to pass the 19th Amendment and for it to be pushed um, on to the states. And so I'm excited to talk more about this, but I do want to emphasize, you know, this is a, this is the year where your vote really matters, and the suffragists really, um, hopefully, are inspiring me to think about that. So definitely check on. Um, your voter registration in order to, you know, weigh in on your own ideas about how American society works. This is a really easy place to do that. I know when you're in college, it's really tough to figure out um, how your address works and where you can vote and that sort of thing. Um, but this uh, organization can help you do that. And if you're interested in learning more about the book, I wanted to pass on this, uh, this code. Uh, just in case you would like 20% off. It is only valid through the University of Chicago Press website. It's UCP New, uh, and I'm happy to put that in the chat if you're interested, but I wanted to, wanted to pass that on to you. So I'm excited to uh, answer your questions tonight, um, and, and so I'm going to cede the floor to you, Joe and Courtney. Thank you so much. That was really incredible. I do love hearing about, you know, sort of the different truths that you don't normally get to hear in like, I, I grew up in a public education. So it was really interesting to hear the different sides, the different, I don't know, facets of this movement and as it developed over time. Um, for everyone who is here and watching, uh, if you do have any questions, which we, we ask that you please ask away, go ahead and click that Q&A down there at the bottom. Um, all right, so it looks like we have one already. Just keep filing them in there. I'll go ahead and start us off though. Um, give me one moment, please. Okay, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so my first sort of question and comment really comes from a place of um, why. Why did they focus on these images and what repercussions did, mm, does, do, I guess, these images have on how women interact and communicate today? That's a really great question. And I think that you know, in, you know, 1775, that first image that I showed, there aren't nearly as many images that are accessible to the broader public. You know, it's, it's, you know, portraits of the king, perhaps, you know, a few paintings being reproduced here and there. But over the 19th century into the 20th, the number of images that are distributed that people have access to grows significantly, which just means that they are more powerful. They are more effective at conveying ideas, um, not only kind of reinforcing ideas of gender and race, but also conveying ideas about politics, who, who the United States was as a nation. Um, so, so these images are powerful. Whenever you see an illustration in like your history textbook that just says, and here's a portrait of George Washington, it's like, no, th this, is, this is making of an icon. This is more than just an illustration of a particular person. And so I think that, um, you know, even today when we're looking at images, it's really important to recognize that they are telling us a particular story. It is so easy to scroll through Instagram or, you know, whatever social media accounts you use and just kind of think it's meaningless. Um, but in fact, they are, you know, telling you, giving you signs, symbols of various kinds of what life in this moment is supposed to be like or what what we should be making fun of um, and therefore kind of reinforcing what it's supposed to be like etc so these images are and were uh, incredibly powerful thank you yes yeah, so we have four questions in the q a section right now so i think we can start off with one of those i can read it aloud so everybody can hear if that's okay All right. So the first one is from James Bajur, 
Beduri, sorry, James. Um, many black activists were erased from the women's suffrage movement. How do, did activists such as Sojourner Truth respond to this discrimination? That's a really great question. So when these black activists were, you know, really erased from the suffrage movement, as uh, this attendee mentions, they responded by doing their best, right? So Sojourner Truth distributes her portrait. She herself kind of refuses to be ignored um, as much as possible. You know, she cannot change the people who were included in the History of Women's Suffrage series, but she can do something else. Um, she can distribute her own photograph on her own. Same with Mary Church Terrell. You know, she is not being included in the images of suffrage leaders that the, the white-led suffrage organizations are putting out. Um, so she decides to do it on her own. And I think that one of the really interesting, you know, like lessons from learning about these activists is just how important it is to kind of be persistent. You know, whatever it is that you are seeking, uh, you need to kind of keep working at it. I mean, these, these activists were working from, you know, over many decades. Um, and some even longer, you know, if we think about the Voting Rights Act as being another pivotal moment uh, in an increase of, of, of voter access, um, many decades and one could argue even a century um, to achieve these goals. So I think persistence is, um, is, a, is an important component of their response to that. Thank you. Um, so you're fine. So the next question is from an anonymous attendee and they're asking, what was the strategic reason do you think of having Inez Muhaland um, ride on the horse and what were they trying to invoke? That's a great question too. And I think it's intended to be, um, you know, she's, she's a herald. She's supposed to be a symbolic figure that is somehow greater than herself in that moment. Um, she's kind of even a Joan of Arc figure. Um, you know, the image that I showed you that was highly colorful from the, you know, 1913 parade, the, the poster, you know, that's of kind of like a, a medieval imagery. Um, they're, they're hearkening back to that, that earlier period um, and thinking about these women as, as leaders who are even bigger than their current moment. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why she does that. And she does it actually not only for the 1913 parade, but also for parades in New York. So this is something that, this is a theme that gets repeated over and over again. I do want to ask another question on top of that. Um, could you comment on the different sort of gender ideals or gender roles that uh, women take on? Um, in my mind, I'm sort of thinking that there's one and it's sort of this feminine uh, motherhood, um, housekeeper, you know, a uh, pot of tea on the stove, taking care of your children, all of that. But then there's also this sort of um, strong above, uh, like the political field layer, just sort of um, robust images as well. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those differences and how they were balanced. Sure, that's a really important question. And, and, and one that really divides activists throughout the movement. Um, and I think our, we could argue divides uh, women in power, women you know, in politics, you know, how they present themselves even today. You know, because there is, you know, by the end of the suffrage movement, one group, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, um, as well, one could say the National Association of Colored Women are emphasizing that women are these elegant, respectable figures, you know, domestic caregivers, exactly the type um, that you were mentioning. On the other hand, we have the National Women's Party picketing the White House, which was incredibly controversial. They were being arrested. They were being put into jail. They were being force fed after they had gone on hunger strikes. And so we have um, a tension between, you know, this emphasis on this argument about equality. You know, women deserve the right to vote because they are equal citizens. Um, which is an argument that originally, you know, Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner Truth, all of them really endorsed. But we also see that um, this, this argument that if women win the vote, they will be, be able to extend their motherly expertise into politics, that one is incredibly powerful. And that is the one that people like President Woodrow Wilson use when they decide to endorse the vote. That is the one that other politicians and other voters use when they decide to finally support women's voting rights. And 
I think that's really important that there was this more moderate um, seemingly acceptable version uh, for these uh, uh, for these political figures to embrace, but that is not to downplay at all the role that the National Women's Party suffragists had because they were a little bit more radical. They kept the issue in the news. They forced people to talk about it and think about it. They were literally at Woodrow Wilson's front steps, even though he pretended they had no impact <laughs> whatsoever on his decision to support suffrage. I refuse to believe that. Um, and I think it's really important to have that more radical component of a social movement to push people um, toward accepting um, a more central, moderate position. I think that we see that in social movements, you know, throughout history, and I'm sure we could give examples today. Thank you. All right, we got our next question. Uh, Haisha Rodriguez, she says, why is the women's suffrage movement being celebrated right now when women of color were not included in the original group? I understand that is an important part of history, but it's only one step in the right direction. And I feel like it should be seen that way. I agree. I think that that is exactly the ways that historians are hoping to present this movement as uh, this moment as a, an important you know, milestone in a movement toward greater access to voting rights. Um, but only one, right? Uh, so, you know, we can think about, you know, Wyoming uh, winning the right to vote in 1869, and that's an important milestone. But in the 19th Amendment is part of that story, but so is the 1924 Native American citizenship of the, the 19, 1924 law that allows, for example, Native Americans greater access to citizenship. Um, and so I think that um, you're right to point out that there are mixed messages. So I have seen organizations kind of using language about celebrating um, and emphasizing that, you know, all women were guaranteed the right to vote um, with the passage of the 19th Amendment. And you know, and I know that that isn't true. Um, and so that's the kind of content that I would say, red flag, maybe find some, some other, you know, there are fantastic podcasts and exhibitions that aren't telling that story right now. Because as we know, actually no one in the United States has a constitutionally guaranteed right to vote. Um, it's a matter of these combination of laws, you know, the 15th Amendment, which prohibits voter uh, discrimination based on race. 19th Amendment prohibits voter discrimination based on sex. But states can pass and do pass laws that prohibit um, that, that regulate voter registration even further. Um, and you guys, I'm sure, have heard about, you know, a voter ID laws being discussed across the United States, you know, whether felons should vote. You know, all of these things, um, you know, really emphasize that who can vote um, is still contested in 2020. Um, and it shows you, reminds us just how powerful the vote is because so many people work so hard to decide who has access to that ballot. Um, so I think that that's a really important point that you're making. Um, and I hope that you find, you know, if you can ignore the, the celebratory, you know, content that isn't quite as, you know, in tune with that, um, that, that correct history, you know, the well-researched history um, and, um, you know, recognize it, you know, I will join you in recognizing it as an important milestone, but certainly not the end of the story. Okay, the next question is from Abigail. And Abigail asks, do you, Dr. Lang, have a background in analyzing photographs, or is this a skill that you acquired while learning about the, the women's suffrage movement? That's a great question. It's learning how to analyze photographs is not something that historians typically do. <laughs> they often prefer uh, letters and newspaper articles and, you know, journals and that sort of thing. Um, but it's something that I uh, really worked on. Um, and it's something that I learned to do perhaps even in, I, I interned in some museums when I was in undergrad. Um, I have attended some wonderful workshops through the American Antiquarian Society's Center for Historic and, and Visual Culture. I minored actually in art history as an undergraduate as well. Um, so this is a skill that, that I kind of had a foundation in um, even before I came to this topic. 
Um, but it was actually the, that photograph that I showed you early on in this presentation of women picking the White House. So that photograph that I'm sure a lot of us have seen before um, that, that really drew me into this topic because, you know, why did these women do this? Why were they posing for this photograph? Why did they hire professional photographers to come out, you know, and take this picture on this particular day? What was the goal? Um, so I think that, you know, this is something that, that you, can, you can certainly hone the skill um, over time too. Awesome, thanks. Um, we have our next question from Megan Query. She says, the images that were shown were primarily portraying women's suffrage in a negative light. And were there others that showed it more positively? And what kind of impacts did the positive images have? Yeah, so I think, it's, I think it always depends on the viewpoint, right? Whose viewpoint are we thinking of to think about it as a positive or negative thing? So for example, the Blanche Ames illustration of her with her children in her idealized home a lot of suffragists in the National American Women Suffrage Association would have seen that as um, an incredibly positive, powerful image, a successful image um, of women's rights activism. Even if today we might look at that and say, well, she's just, they're just putting her in this, you know, this box um, and confining her um, to those particular roles. And you know, we may not see it in that same light. Um, and I think that when we're thinking about those, those photographs of women picketing the White House, parading in the streets, those images were distributed in newspapers. They were reprinted over and over and over again. Um, and those are the other um, type of um, celebratory images, you know, uh, news images of the suffrage movement that people would have looked to. Some people would have looked at, looked at them and, you know, scoffed and gotten angry and said, why are these women in the streets? But suffragists would have looked at them and said, you know, they would have been inspired. Um, and I'm sure that you can think of images, you know, even today, um, where people have very different reactions uh, to the same image. Actually, that is an amazing segue into our next question, which sort of also connects images today to, uh, f to and from images uh, from this movement. So Janelle asks, I think, or she says, I think there are many parallels between the Black Lives Matter movement and the NACW and that they're polarized people on opposing sides. Did Paul achieve her vision or did it fall short from what she pictured? What does this mean for the path of the Black Lives Matter movement? I think that's a really, uh, you know, useful question to think about today. You know, what what can, what lessons can we take away from learning about historical images when we think about our current moment? Um, the National Association of Colored Women um, they uh, really tried to be as not as polar, you know, as you know, benign as they could. Um, their goal was to not create polarizing imagery. However, you know, as we just mentioned, you know, that's not to say that people were, you know, people were plenty angry sometimes when they saw an image of Terrell looking as, you know, she was quite wealthy, um, looking as elegant and refined um, as she did. Um, so I think that that, that, that in itself can, could have, was polarizing um, in that moment. Um, so when we're thinking about, you know, did these groups achieve their vision or did they, you know, fall short of this path? And I think it's fair to say that um, none of the groups fully achieved, you know, the social justice uh, hopes, ambitions that they had, right? I mean, technically the 19th Amendment was passed, but as we just, you know, mentioned, the 19th Amendment um, was just one step um, in that um, effort towards women's voting rights. Um, and I, and you know, the National Association of Colored Women, you know, they were um, fighting against lynching, you know, the violence against black people. And that's something that the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, a century later is still working on. Um, and so I think that these visions are, are not realized. And if there's anything I've learned from studying these movements is that it takes a really long time to affect change. And I think that we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, this is a movement that has been around for, you know, several years now. Um, and it's easy to kind of see 
um, these important moments, important pivotal moments, you know, even today um, in the announcement about um, Rihanna Taylor's death, um, you know, that is uh, perhaps uh, maybe in a week we'll say it was a pivotal moment, maybe not, can't really say yet, um, but this is a long-term conversation. And, you know, I think we could trace the evolution from the anti-slavery movement to the civil rights movement to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and, and same with women's rights activism over time. Um, and we could see how that changes um, and evolves. All right, our next question is from Jen Wallish, and she says, which female activists do you think should be most studied by young women working towards a successful and respectable career in politics? That's a great question. And I have to say that Mary Church Terrell is someone I would study intensely. She was, um, as I said, she was this, you know, the, one of the first black women in the United States to earn an undergraduate degree. She was from a particularly wealthy family. She was able to collaborate with white suffragists in a really meaningful way, present at their conventions, um, work with them. She worked with Alice Paul. She worked with the National American Women's Suffrage Association as well. But she also recognized that they were never going to support her in the way that she needed. And so that she knew that she had to do things on her own as well. But she was able to kind of strategically engage with, you know, so many different organizations um, that, you know, weren't always fully aligned with her in a way that I think is really fascinating. Um, she has actually not ever had a biography of her, and it's the first one ever is coming out later this year. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And if you're interested in reading, you know, about her life in her own words, she actually wrote an autobiography of herself, A Colored Woman in a White World. And the Library of Congress just recently digitized and transcribed all of her papers. So even if you don't know much about Mary Church Terrell now, um, I, today is actually her birthday. Um, and so this is, I think that what, I, what I've seen, um, you know, as someone who's been studying the suffrage movement in the last, you know, decade or so, I've seen a dramatic increase um, in the rise of people who are interested in Terrell and learning about Terrell. Um, and I would, I would highly recommend checking her out. She is a fascinating uh, figure and brilliant political strategist. She actually was, even in her 80s, picketing segregated restaurants in Washington, D.C. She truly led a, a fascinating life. Thanks, Courtney. There's, there's someone coming down the hall to to, to talk to you. I see him. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So, our sorry, they're just closing up, closing the building in it. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um. So our next question is also from Haisha. She says, "Why is it important for us uh, POC women to be as excited for this year like white feminists are?" I don't think. I'm going to tell anyone that they have to feel a particular way about the 19th Amendment centennial. I will say that there has been uh, an incredible shift um, from how people are thinking about the suffrage movement. You know, when we're thinking about how this story is being told to popular audiences in 2020, it is incredibly different than how it was being told 10 years ago, five years ago. If you go to the US Congress Suff Buffs blog, they have um, essays written by you know, famous historians about queer women in the suffrage movement, about black women in the suffrage movement, about men in the suffrage movement, telling a very different story of suffrage that you ever read about in your high school history textbook, which probably actually only had just one line saying that I took the amendment granted to women the right to vote or something along the lines of that. Um, there are fantastic podcasts um, and Nothing Less, uh, which is a podcast that is hosted by Retta and Rosario Dawson. Um, and I think that they bring a really like fun, fascinating perspective um, on the movement. Um, there's a brand new book out called Vanguard by Martha Jones, which specifically looks at the ways that Black women were leaders in the women's rights and women's suffrage movement. 
So here's why I think that it, you should be interested, at least in this particular moment. And that's because the story is changing um, and women of color are being placed um, um, instead of kind of as supporters of white led organizations, um, which they certainly were, um, they're being placed at the forefront as leaders. Um, and so I think that, you know, learning about these women who came before us, who, you know, are women of color is incredibly valuable. And, and that's, that's one thing to be excited about in this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, the next question is for me, myself and I, I will say. Um, so from my understanding, you are probably one of the most experienced um, people and educators in this world who has the most exposure to these images and to this movement uh, through these images and whatnot. Um, and I was wondering from all of this what do you think is the number one misconception about the suffrage movement like from a popular um, standpoint you know i actually would come back to that previous question i think that, that one of the main misconceptions is that all suffragists were white you know um all suffragists were women is also not true um one of the things we learn is that suffragists really constructed this image of their movements, that they looked like middle and upper white American women. Um, and that leaves out the incredibly broad range of working women, of women of color, of you know, immigrant women. You know, there's suffrage propaganda that's not only in English, but in other languages. Um, but you know, the dominant image that we see um, in so many documentaries and exhibitions, or, or we're seeing, it's really changed a lot, um, really didn't emphasize that. Um, and so one of the things that I've been excited about is, is yeah, seeing that story change um, and seeing that myth being attacked and chipped away at, you know, a little bit, um, especially over the past, um, the past year or so, um, because this has been a really important moment to make women's history part of national conversations. And so that's been incredibly, you know, a, a valuable, you know, um, thing because often we don't have, we don't have a National Women's History Museum. We don't have exhibitions at major institutions that focus on women and women's history. Um, and yet in the past year we've had I don't know, the, I don't want to say the wrong number, but multiple Smithsonian institutions launching major exhibitions about uh, women's history. And that's, that's, you know, unprecedented. Um, so this is, um, this is, you know, a moment to change that myth. <laughs> it's a moment to educate, absolutely. All right, so our next question is from Max Karras. He is, asks, how often did wives of politicians lobby on behalf of their husband's agenda? Was it effective and were they taken seriously? Yes, uh, women, um, particularly elite wealthier women, um, have been lobbying to support their husbands since the nation's founding. In fact, one of the things that really surprised me as I was doing research for my book is how much women like Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, these early first ladies were really looked at as ideals for women in politics, right? So they were doing the behind the scenes lobbying. They were hosting the gatherings, deciding who would be invited, making the connections, um, you know, supporting, you know, conversations that they wanted to see. And in that way, they were, you know, not, not lobbying in the 21st century sense uh, with, you know, bank account, bank accounts, expenses that you have to report you know, to the government and that sort of thing. Um, but um, very much the same idea. Um, so that is um, a component that, that has been part of our society for, you know, oh, hundreds of years. Um, and uh, I think it does continue to this day, you know, first ladies are, have expanded their roles um, since um, the moment, the, the era of Martha Washington, when she was really supposed to be seen as a supporter of his presidency. Um, in contrast, in the 21st century, we often expect our first ladies to kind of, you know, have a platform that they're interested in and have a platform that they'd like to see succeed. Um, 
But another place where women uh, were lobbying in support of their husband's agendas, I think, um, is in the anti-suffrage movement, um, which you might know was often led by women. Uh, women founded those organizations. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, they really, these are most often the women who are actually, you know, having dinner with the governor or something, right? So they don't need the vote because they're able to like, you know, influence politics in a very different way. Um, so that's a really important thing to think about too. Cool, thank you. The next question is from another anonymous attendee and it says, how did the exclusion of women in the 15th amendment affect the later exclusion of black women in the women's suffrage amendment? That's a really important question because, and there are, you know, I can think of two books off the top of my head by spectacular scholars who are, who are looking at this precise topic because it's so uh, complicated. So as this, uh, this person probably already knows, um, in the late 1860s, the American Equal Rights Association, which actually fought for universal suffrage, so the right to vote for um, people of color, but also women, um, and there's a moment in the late 1860s when that organization basically falls apart because um, Republicans um, and the organization members decide to endorse the 15th Amendment without enfranchising women. And so this does, you know, this, this forces this, this, you know, movement of this idealized vision of universal suffrage, that movement falls apart. Um, in that moment. And that's the moment when Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton start their own organization, the National Women's Suffrage Association. And that is largely a white organization. In contrast, Lucy Stone in Boston establishes the American Women's Suffrage Association. That group is far larger. It has far more um, men um, and women of color who are participating in it. And that's the organization that actually was written out of the history of women's suffrage, which is probably probably like very few people on this in this chat have any idea who Lucy Stone is today, but um, she was pretty vital for uh, keeping the movement together throughout the late 19th century. Um, so this this conversation about um, you know the the relationship between the 15th and the 19th Amendment is. Uh, is still being examined today. And I think that, you know, one of the ways that the 15th Amendment influenced the 19th is that it did create um, a greater divide between white female activists and activists of color um, where there had been far more collaboration before the 15th Amendment. Yeah, thank you. Um... I, we have a couple more. I don't think there's any more viewer questions. So I can ask one of mine. Courtney and I got the chance to read. Uh, we have a copy of your book right here, each of us. So um, my question is, um, you mentioned in the, just in the introduction that the fear of women casting their vote together to form a voting block was like really serious. And, um, I was wondering, like, how, like, do you think this is still, uh, like, a problem in the world today? Because I feel like we sort of see this in something as, like, have we have too many women in Congress, they could be a voting bloc, or something very simple, like, there's too many women at liberal arts colleges, like, in America. Do you think this is, like, a problem that we still face, like, yes or no, and why do you think we still have this problem? I think we still talk about this, right? Even though in our experience, you know, we've observed the way women vote, for example, in Congress, and we know that they do not vote as a block, yeah. right? Um, and we know based on elections data that women as a group do not vote as a block. And so I think it's really interesting. I think, you know, as you know, from having read the book, you know, in the introduction, I, I really want to think about, you know, the fact that suffragists, you know, emphasizing that women as mothers will vote to, you know, take care of their families better. You know, that's a myth. And the suffragists themselves knew that was a myth. You know, their publicity professionals were like, this will sell, this will win people over. Um, but even if you think about the way that, you know, female parents, you know, were to, you know, 
put, you know, input into their children's education that in schools, for example, you're not going to get a room of mothers to agree that one particular idea is always the best way to go. <laughs> and so I think that this idea of a women's block is just, um, you know, really bizarre, uh, a bizarre detail. And it's one that suffragists like Alice Paul, you know, Mary Church Terrell knew was false, you know, from the beginning. And so, um, you know, I think it is interesting that we're still thinking about that today. Um, although that I think that in the 2020 election, it's changed a little bit. I don't know if you guys have been, you know, paying attention to the, the blocks that people are kind of commenting on, um, whether it's, you know, particularly like suburban women or, you know, black women or, you know, people are differentiating it um, in, in a much more significantly uh, than thinking about women voting as a whole. Thanks. So one of the questions that have been on my mind uh, since we sort of this event sort of came up is how images have really changed over time of women. So at the beginning in that 17, I think 57, maybe photograph. 75, yeah. 75, thank you. I, ap I apologize. I flipped those numbers right there. Um, in that photograph, it really did show women in that, um, in those abnormal roles. I will say, um, and I was wondering how the focus of these women and maybe who the, in, who the intended audience is, how has that changed over the suffrage movement and, and if continued over time? So I think one thing that's interesting that, that I think this question is getting at too. I, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Is that, you know, when I show some of these, you know, anti-women's rights cartoons to my students, their initial response is usually these are early feminist pictures, right? <laughs> They're like women participating in politics, whether it's petitioning or going to a rally or whatever, you know, being leaders. Um, but, you know, in the 19th century, that was an absurd idea that everyone should laugh at. And you're right, it's changed over time because now women are, you know, in these positions of leadership. And now if you scroll through Instagram, you may very well see a father carrying a child and you're not intended to laugh at it. You're supposed to say, oh, look, you know, so-and-so is parenting their child as, as they do uh, in the 21st century. And so you're right, these, these, these ideas have changed quite dramatically over time. And yet we still do have um, some uh, a legacy, an echo of these earlier images, right? And um, one of my favorite examples is that that um, a vote for the celebrated man tamer billboard in that in the print, because it just feels like you know I, maybe you guys remember the the nutcrackers that were being sold for Hillary during Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, there's still that kind of rhetoric and imagery about women in power, even in the 21st century. And there's still this kind of rhetoric um, that, you know, women in politics kind of emphasize that they are caregivers, you know, their social media may uh, emphasize that they are at home with their families cooking dinner every once in a while. Um, I thought it was really interesting that um, one of the, the main things that the first lady took on with this 2020 centennial commemoration is actually having an art contest. Uh, for children. And so there's this emphasis on, you know, her interest in children, you know, kind of caring for children, which is very much, you know, harkens back to the way that women were expected to engage in politics, you know, a century ago. Um, and I think that, you know, you can make the same case for, you know, um, Michelle Obama thinking about, you know, health and caregiving with her as well. And so there are there are certain ways that, that we've changed a lot in the way that we see imagery in the 21st century, but there are certain themes that, that we're still kind of stuck with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it seems like we're getting close to the end. There's no more viewer questions. So I would just like to ask, do you have anything that you'd like to add or wrap up with before we finish up? Well, I'd say that, you know, we've talked a lot about how images, you know, are part of our society and change ideas. So I would say just, you know, continue to be critical of the images that you see and think about, you know, what these images are trying to say. 
Um, and of course, make sure your voter registration is all set. You know, I, I you know, Absolutely. it's hard, you know, as someone who studies women's voting rights and, and someone who knows how hard people have had to fight for these voting rights, um, it's something that I certainly value and encourage others to value. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thank you. You guys did a great yeah. job. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah. Um, this was really fun. Uh, Courtney, anything? Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Dr. Lang, thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us and for answering all of our many questions. Um, thank you, Neil, for hosting as well. And um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Yeah. Yes, thank you for hosting. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks. thanks, guys. Have a good night. It's very nice to meet you. Thanks to meet you too. Are we supposed to